Halley's Comet, with its star-like head and great luminous tail, sweeps across the heavens on its long voyage beyond the farthest planet. I came in with a comet, he said, and I shall go out with a comet. One of America's greatest humorists wrote these prophetic lines. His name is Mark Twain. And this is his biography. Mike Wallace, this is Biography. Our story, Mark Twain. Mark Twain gave the world rich, warm-hearted laughter when he described the adventures of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. But Twain's books were also laced with cynicism, and at times he was downright insulting to his fellow man. Yet even in his least rollicking moods, there are moments of humor and sympathy. For Mark Twain had an understanding of life given to few men. Mark Twain rests quietly on the porch of his lonely house, an old man watching the dawn of the 20th century. His world has changed, his time is gone, yet he feels a sense of relief. The title of world's greatest humorist has been a heavy burden. There have been times in his life when he wished there were no Mark Twain, only a Sam Clemens. Samuel Langhorne Clemens arrives prematurely on November 30th, 1835, as if to be on hand for the appearance of Halley's Comet over the town of Florida in Monroe County, Missouri. Sam's father is a lawyer, a dreamer, and a promoter of failures. His son will never see or hear him laugh. Of mixed English and Irish stock, the Clemens women take pride in their pre-revolutionary heritage. When Sam is four, the family moves to Hannibal on the Mississippi. And when he's big enough, he's sent to a private school that charges 25 cents per week per pupil. Sam hates school, and risking the inevitable birching, he often plays hooky. The most important things he learns are not picked up in school, but from life in Hannibal. From the frontiersmen with their hard-headed logic and rough humor, from the pioneers of an expanding America passing through on their way west. He learns from the fantasy world of the traveling circuses with their clowns, caged animals, and brass bands. The bright canvas colors which attract the country folk from miles around. From the fields around Hannibal, he learns the difference in taste of a watermelon honestly come by and one acquired by art. He learns what freedom and independence are like from the prairie hawk hanging motionless in the sky. He thrills to stories told by firelight, and he learns the power of a tale well told. Young Sam Clemens comes to know ugly things too. Slaves chained for transportation to the markets. He sees men killed in brutal waterfront brawls. And the boy is troubled by the sight of death and man's inhumanity to man. But Sam's sharpest impressions come from the great Mississippi, rolling its mile-wide tide along, shining in the sun. With its giant trading scows piled with goods from places with far-off names, Memphis, Natchez, and New Orleans. 
the Mississippi with its secret islands. Places of mystery and adventure for boys like Sam Clemens. Sam sees the godlike river pilot, and he dreams that one day he too will pilot a steamboat. Black smoke tumbling from its tall stacks, big stern wheel beating the water white. A wild dream for a barefoot boy in Hannibal, Missouri. But boyhood for Sam Clemens ends at 14, when his father dies, leaving the family too poor for the luxury of Sam's 25 cent a week education. Until his older brother, Orion, buys the Hannibal Journal and hires Sam as an apprentice printer. The paper is for him a poor boy's college. Two years later, his first story, The Dandy Frightening the Squatter, appears in the carpet bag, a Boston magazine. Armed with this success, he feels he is ready to leave Hannibal. He makes a promise to his mother. I do solemnly swear, he says, that I will not throw a card or drink a drop of liquor while I am gone. Then the 18-year-old Sam sets out to see the world. Sam lets four years slip by while he sizes up his fellow man in all sorts of places. In April 1857, he boards the Paul Jones for New Orleans, the first leg of a journey to Brazil to have a look at the Amazon jungles. But once on board, his boyhood ambition to be a river pilot is reawakened. Sam forgets the Amazon and spends the next three days convincing the boat's pilot Horace Bixby that he needs an assistant. Bixby agrees to teach Sam the ways of the Mississippi from New Orleans to St. Louis, all 1,300 miles of it. In time, Sam Clemens becomes master of almost a thousand tons of floating Rococo splendor, driven by the power of live steam. For Sam, these are his best days. He sees the river in all its moves. He pilots his boat around rocks and skims dangerously over the sandbars. And when the water is safe again beneath the bow, he hears the leadsman call, Mark Twain. Mark Twain goes the chant, and the deckhands relax in the sun. Mark Twain, and the stern wheel increases its beat again. Sam uses his newfound grandeur as a river pilot to get a job for his younger brother, Henry, on another boat, the Pennsylvania. But Henry is killed when the Pennsylvania's boiler explodes. And Sam is heartbroken. He feels he is responsible for his brother's death. 1861. The Civil War brings a new kind of disaster to the river and ends Sam's piloting career. At the age of 25, he gives up the Mississippi and the boyhood dream that came true. For the sleepy town of Hannibal in the half-northern, half-southern state of Missouri, the Civil War is a confusing affair. The town folk spend much of their time trying to choose a side. The Clemens boys, Sam and his older brother Orion, are deadlocked. Sam is for the South, Orion is a Yankee. The argument continues until they reach a compromise. Orion persuades Sam to go west with him to the new territory of Nevada. On August 19, 1861, the Dusty Clemens brothers arrive in Carson City, Nevada. Gold and silver mining are Nevada's industries, 
drinking and murder its recreations. Sam never amounts to much as a miner, partly because of his reawakening interest in writing. Then, in the summer of 1862, he walks 130 miles to Virginia City, a town which has grown wealthy with the discovery of the fabulous Comstock Silver Lode. Sam Clemens goes directly to a newspaper called the Territorial Enterprise. My name is Sam Clemens, he says quietly, and I've come to write for your paper. Sam brings the Enterprise a vigorous style and a fresh point of view. He lampoons and satirizes pork barrel politics and everything else the territory takes seriously. And he soon earns some formidable enemies. Hoping to throw indignant and possibly violent readers off the track, Sam begins to sign his humorous articles by a new name, Mark Twain. But the climate in Virginia City is too hot, even for Mark Twain. And so Sam drifts to San Francisco and takes a job with the Morning Call. The Call refuses some of his articles concerning local police brutality. But Sam sends his acid humor off to the Devil May Care Enterprise in Nevada. This results in a quick sellout of all copies of the Enterprise as soon as they arrive in San Francisco. Sam's passion for justice makes him popular with everyone but the police. During the winter of 1864, he tries mining again at Angel's Camp in the Sierra foothills. Instead of gold, he finds material for a story he will call The Jumping Frog of Calaveras County. The appearance of the jumping frog in the Saturday press sets New York in an uproar. Sam's way of life changes dramatically. He will never again be Sam Clemens of Hannibal, Missouri, but rather Mark Twain, the wild humorist of the West. Now his writings are much in demand, but instead of accepting the comfortable offers at home, Mark's restlessness makes him take an unusual assignment. He sets out to do a series of travel articles about Europe and the Holy Land. Aboard the ship Quaker City, bound for the Holy Land, Mark Twain falls deeply in love for the first time in all his 32 years. Unfortunately, the young lady, Olivia Langdon, is not on board, but 3,000 miles away in Elmira, New York. For the moment, she is only an ivory miniature carried in her brother's pocket. But from the day his friend Charles Langdon shows him the miniature, Olivia will never be out of Mark's thoughts. For the next five months, Mark sends colorful and humorous articles back to an eagerly waiting America. He makes his stop in Paris a delightfully vivid experience for his readers. While he pokes fun at himself as a wide-eyed tourist, he describes Europe as old and slightly mad.
Mark Twain comes home a national celebrity, and he wastes no time in laying siege to the Langdon mansion. Just 22, genteel, delicate Olivia is intrigued but frightened by this wild man who claims to have fallen in love with her picture. Her father admires Mark, but bringing this volatile personality into the family is another matter. Mr. Langdon asks for references. Mark writes to his old pals in Nevada for recommendations. Brilliant, has a great future, they all agree, but would make the worst husband on record. Despite this help, Mark wins out, and on February 2nd, 1870, Olivia Langdon becomes Mrs. Samuel Langhorn Clemens. Soon after his first book, Innocence Abroad, is published, Mark Twain is acclaimed the greatest humorist of the age. His success with Innocence Abroad is followed by even more acclaim for Roughing It, a story of his life in the West, and by The Gilded Age, a satire and burlesque of the era of President Grant. Now, within a few brief years, Sam Clemens, the pioneer boy from Hannibal, is the famous, respected, and wealthy Mark Twain. His new home in Hartford, Connecticut has 19 rooms, a balcony like a riverboat wheelhouse, a porch like a riverboat's deck, Three girls, Clara, Jean, and Susie, are born to the Twains. Susie is his favorite, but he loves them all with a quiet devotion. Then, in the 1870s, two imaginary boys are born at the Twain house. They are named Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. With Tom and Huck, Mark Twain takes his readers back to the Mississippi to a time that is forever summer. Where small boys will always stand on the riverbank to catch first sight of steamboats with new white paint and polished brass. And the hay in the field smells rich and ready for the wagon. back to the quiet southern town that will never know more evil than it needs to make it exciting. Mark Twain's three books, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Life on the Mississippi, and the immortal Huckleberry Finn are the beginning of a remarkable outpouring of short stories, articles, and novels. Among them, the Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, and the Prince and the Pauper. By 1890, Mark's prestige is immense. He is listened to and quoted by queens and emperors. In London and Vienna, traffic is stopped to let him pass. Mark is admired by renowned authors like Rudyard Kipling and Robert Louis Stevenson. He meets and makes a friend of young Winston Churchill. And George Bernard Shaw calls Mark Twain by far the greatest American writer. But at the peak of his fame and good fortune, the earth begins to tremble beneath Mark Twain. His business ventures fail to show a profit and then become a growing drain on his savings. Mark realizes that he has dangerously overextended himself. And for the next year, he works desperately to avoid financial disaster. But it is too late. In 1895, ill, almost 60 now, Mark and his wife Livy leave for a world lecture tour to pay off his creditors. The exhausting trip ends in London, where their daughters Susie and Jean are to join them while Mark writes a book of his travels. But the children do not come. Across the Atlantic, Susie, his favorite, dies of meningitis.
Now Livy declines into invalidism. And Mark Twain begins to feel that the gods have turned against him. His new book, Following the Equator, is the work of a man dazed by sorrow. The wild humorist of the West has all but lost his humor. He seeks relief in work, but he finds it hard to concentrate. I read the morning paper, he says, well knowing I shall find in it the usual depravities, baseness, hypocrisies, and cruelties that make up civilization, causing me to plead for the damnation of the human race. Because of Livy's failing health, Mark takes the family to the warm hills of Italy. But at their little villa near Florence, in June of 1904, Livy dies. At quarter past nine this evening, Mark writes, she that was the life of my life passed to the relief and peace of death. I am tired and old. I wish I were with Libby. Except for one last trip to England to receive an honorary degree from Oxford, Mark Twain will never travel again. Mark Twain's last two years are spent at his new home in Reading, Connecticut, with his daughter, Jean. Here, despite recurring heart pains, he smokes as many as 20 cigars a day and restlessly plays billiards until far into the night. Then, on Christmas Day of 1909, Jean Clemens dies of an epileptic convulsion. Well, he says with tragic resignation to a friend, I suppose you have heard of this final disaster. 1910. A lonely Mark Twain watches the close of the first decade of the 20th century. He feels that he has been made to outlive almost everything he has ever loved. But his fighting spirit remains unbroken and his power with words has not deserted him. He expresses his answer to the questions of life and death in his final work, The Mysterious Stranger. There is no God, no human race, no heaven, no hell. It is all a dream, a grotesque and foolish dream. Man is but a thought a useless thought, a homeless thought, wandering forlorn among the empty eternities. But these words, written by a Mark Twain, bitter and disillusioned by tragedy, are overlooked and all but forgotten by a world that will be forever grateful for the laughter and warmth of his vintage years. Then on April 20th, 1910, 74 years and five months since it passed over the Clemens cabin in Monroe County, Missouri, Halley's Comet appears with its great luminous tail sweeping across the night heavens on its long voyage beyond the farthest planet. I came in with the comet, said Sam Clemens, and I shall go out with the comet. The next day, Mark Twain is dead. In almost every language, in almost every library throughout the world, there is a row of books written by Sam Clemens. These books still hold the same special delights they did for readers almost a century ago. They endure because, like their creator, they are a unique combination of fantasy and truth, pessimism and hope. They express the unmistakable spirit of the man called Mark Twain. Mike Wallace for Biography.